It sounds straightforward enough. You take liquid fertilizer, spray it on your plants, and then walk away while the leaves absorb all the nutrients. But like most things in gardening, it's not that simple. Join me today as I help you understand foliar feeding. Hi, I'm Gardener Scott, and the concept behind foliar feeding is pretty simple. You take nutrients that the plants need, apply them in a liquid form to the foliage, the leaves, and then the plant will absorb those nutrients and help grow even stronger. A lot of gardeners do foliage feeding, and it really got a big boost in the 1950s when a study out of Michigan State University showed that leaves can be very efficient in absorbing nutrients. As often happens when a little bit of research shows a new way of doing things in the garden, many businesses began to market fertilizers specifically for foliar feeding and then touting the benefits. But since the 1950s, a lot of research has shown and many universities report that it's only about 15 to 20 percent effective as far as the leaves absorbing the nutrients that we place on them. It's still not completely understood just exactly how the nutrients are absorbed by the leaves. The conventional wisdom is that it's the stomata. The stomata are cells on the underside of leaves. It's kind of like our nose. During the day, the leaves absorb carbon dioxide from the air and put it into the plant. At night, oxygen and excess moisture leaves out through the stomata. In the process of transpiration, kind of like our breathing, the plant regulates how it's growing and how it's absorbing nutrients. But those nutrients are coming from the roots. The stomata can absorb some liquid, but kind of like our nose, that's not what it's designed to do. The University of Missouri reports that it's more likely very small micropores on the leaf cuticle that's absorbing the nutrients. When you look at the basic information so far, whether it's the stomata or those minute pores in the leaf cuticle, the idea that there are holes in the leaf that that liquid fertilizer can flow into does make some sense. But when you look at the science behind cell structure within the leaf, it doesn't make as much sense. Those cells are negatively charged, which means they will attract positively charged ions like calcium and magnesium and potassium and the ammonium form of nitrogen. But they tend to repel other negatively charged ions like sulfur and phosphorus and the nitrate form of nitrogen. Some of the nutrient ions are just too big to fit through the cells, and others that do enter the leaf actually become immobile. So calcium and copper and iron and manganese and zinc will enter the leaf, but really don't transfer any farther into the plant beyond just the entry point. And so the more you begin looking at the science behind the leaf and the nutrient ions, the more you see that foliar feeding may not be the best way to feed plants. Dr. Linda Chalker Scott from Washington State University in her article, The Myth of Foliar Feeding, says that it's only suitable for micronutrients, those nutrients that can be absorbed and that the plant needs in just very small amounts. It is not an effective way to give the macronutrients that the plants need. The best way to do that is with the soil. And that's how I garden. I don't use any type of foliar feeding and I actually use very little fertilizer of any type throughout my garden. My leaves, my plants are beautiful because I focus on the soil, the soil life providing the nutrients through the organic matter that I put in the soil. 
It's the macronutrients in the soil that have most of my attention when it comes to providing nutrition for the plants. I had a soil test done on this entire area before I started building my garden. And I know my soil is deficient in nitrogen and phosphorus and potassium. That's why I'm taking the effort to amend the soil and increase the microbe life. I also know that the secondary macronutrients, the calcium, the manganese, and the sulfur, are at okay levels in my soil. So I don't need to worry too much about those. The key is that all of those primary and secondary macronutrients are not transferred through the leaves as the most efficient way to feed the plant. It's through the soil that they get those macronutrients. If you haven't done a soil test and you're relying on fertilizers because you suspect you have deficiencies, it's still a good idea for those macronutrients to feed the soil. And that is the best way to feed your plants. That doesn't mean that foliar feeding has no place in your garden. Anecdotal evidence and some studies have shown that it can be effective in hydroponic growing and in container gardening. In my green stock vertical garden this year, I have brand new fresh potting soil. And that potting soil has fertilizer in it. I haven't had to add any to these plants, but if I reuse this potting soil next year and I begin to see some deficiencies in the way the plants are growing, foliar feeding can give a quick burst of the nutrients to the plants. The preferred method is still to feed the soil, but for a quick fix, foliar feeding is often enough. This is one reason why many gardeners use foliar feeding with their house plants that are being grown in pots without maybe fully understanding how it works. You may also see that you can spray calcium on your tomato leaves to help cure blossom end rot. Well, remember, calcium is absorbed by the leaves, but it doesn't travel far. So you need to do it when the flowers are starting to develop into fruit and then use the foliar spray right there at the leaves near the fruit so that the calcium doesn't have to travel far. It's the fruit that needs to absorb the calcium, not the rest of the plant. I still advocate proper watering. Consistent moisture levels in your soil is usually the best way to deal with blossom end rot. If you suspect you have a micronutrient deficiency in your plants and want to do foliar feeding, be aware that those micronutrients are often needed in such small quantities in the plant that they can be easily overdone. So it's better to start small and add more than to add too much of the nutrient right up front, which could actually damage your plants. And the time of application can be important, especially if only 15 to 20 percent of the nutrients are actually making it into the plant. Don't do it in the heat of the day when most of that water is going to evaporate anyway. Do it when it's overcast or in early evening. It's more likely that the plants are going to absorb those liquid nutrients. Recognizing that most of the stomata and pores are actually on the underside of the leaves means that just spraying from the top down is not going to be as effective as spraying from the bottom up. And different plants with different leaves will absorb the nutrients better. Thick, waxy leaves are going to absorb the nutrients at a much different rate than the thin, papery leaves. So if you want to do foliar feeding, you might want to look into a little more research to find out just exactly which of the nutrients are best to apply on the specific plants that you want to apply them for. Because you may end up wasting your time and energy and money by applying a foliar fertilizer that either can't be absorbed by the plant or might have very little effect on the improvement of the plant. And some of those magic concoctions you see that you can mix up and spray on the plants, I would caution against those as well. Because if the ions are too big, if it can't even be absorbed by the leaf, again, 
You're wasting your time, your energy, and your money. If you're not currently foliar feeding your garden and you're focused on the soil building practices, it's probably something you don't need to start. If you're not doing it and you're interested in it, this is a great opportunity to experiment with different methods of feeding your plant. Either way, if you want to learn more about gardening, check out one of these videos next. I'm Gardener Scott. Enjoy gardening. Mm -hmm.